My guest today is Laurie Goldstein. Apart from being an emblematic journalist with the Toronto Sun, he's also a distinguished emeritus editor. He is the winner of some of the rather better awards in Canadian journalism. But to me, what makes him singular is that he is one of the few main platform journalists who at least intrudes a certain level of scrutiny and skepticism into the discussion of the most perniciously alarming issue of our day, which is global warming. It's a treat to have a journalist that stands apart from the pack, and I'm going to be speaking with him very shortly. Larry, I'll start with a couple of particulars. I've been reading in the last couple of days that after how many years in BC with the carbon tax, which I believe began as revenue neutral, and then as always, uh, the, the promise evaporated and is with everything else, uh, their carbon emissions have gone up. And they're the first one, and they were the template for, well, according to the Minister for All of North America. Secondly, if I'm reading it right, the only major government that isn't part of the Paris Agreement is the United States. Uh, they're not part of it. They won't have any carbon taxes, and they're drilling uh, like squirrels before fall. Their emissions have gone down. Where is the logic that somehow or other in Canada, the small country that it is, where carbon taxes proved to be in reverse, at least in BC, why are we even talking about this? Well, to, to begin, um, I guess you could make the argument, and the environmentalists will, that it would have been worse in British Columbia if they hadn't imposed a carbon tax, which they originally started as revenue neutral, but no longer is. But Rex, the, the problem is that the whole discussion is based on a fantasy. Yeah. They've been talking, global leaders have been talking about this for about 30 years. Yeah, 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 exactly. Rio. About 30 years. Uh, last year, our em global emissions went up almost 3%. Um, in, from 2016 to 2017 in Canada, which are the last figures we have, we always seem to be a year behind, uh, they went up 8 million tons. Um, uh, China, which is the one of the major emitters, uh, not because they're evil people, but because they want not, to not the people they need. Yeah, they need to industrialize. Went up, I believe, over four percent. The United States, for a time uh, under Trump, was lowering, primarily because Shale. they were using fracking to get natural gas, and they were replacing coal-fired electricity with a natural gas, which burns at about half the carbon intensity. But the, but the pressure is again starting on them. But but. The point here to me is there are no good players and bad players. The problem is that our politicians are talking about things that, with respect, most of them don't understand. They don't understand the enormity of what they're asking people to do. And they don't understand that if they want people to make these enormous changes, they have to lead. You cannot tell people yeah. to lower their consumption and travel every year to some United Nations gab fest in some um, uh, tourist resort, which is where they always are, of they are, where in the course of 12 days, they emit more greenhouse gases than a mid-sized African country. You can't, people look at that, and whatever their politics are, they go, okay, you're not serious. You don't really believe the world is facing an imminent existential threat from, um, because if you were, you wouldn't be buying properties on ocean fronts. You wouldn't be building in uh, floodplains. Um, this, you know, in elections, they fly all over the country. Why? They don't have to do that. With technology today, we have ways that you could do all of these things without emitting an excess. Now, that would be good no matter what. Yeah. Saving fossil fuels Temperance is good. would be good no matter what. Um, adapting to climate change would be good no matter what. Improve uh, your building codes. Uh, stop building on shorelines. It's bad when humans live very close to water. Um, uh, uh, so so the more, um, more insulation, homes, you know, getting, helping people do that, all legitimate. So there are a whole bunch of things we could do that would be a good start no matter what. But instead of doing that, we have this 10 pound, 1,000 pound elephant in the room that, that crowds out everything else. It crowds out dumping raw sewage yeah. into lakes. It, it, it dumps out disposing safely of nuclear waste. It, 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 and, and all we do, it's part, it's part of the culture war now. Where you stand on climate change, right, is like abortion and death penalty. So it's no longer about the issue. It, it's, just, it's, a, it's just a cultural debate. And to me, with respect, it's meaningless. It's a surrogate issue. In other words, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be about this particular 
natural thing. But as you just said, and on this point, I totally agree with you. Uh, it's a declaration if you're well off and you're in a first world and you've got a secure income and a secure job that you look around uh, at the second-hand Mercedes, which is the second car, and say, I'm throwing out the plastic bags and therefore I, but yeah, I like this fool idea of plastic straws. If the world is going to end in eight to 12 years, which some of the, well, Elizabeth May seems to believe that, why do you care about plastic straws? Well, I always try to be fair. They are I saying, don't. <laughs> they are saying that, 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 that the, the problem may be that the problem may become irreversible. Not that, that we're all gonna, but, but, but look, I would just go by um, in Canada, what we call the Laurentian elite. All the, you know, all the yeah, smart know, people in Montreal and Vancouver. And, and what, are, what are they saying really to China? What they are really saying to China is, sorry, you can't use fossil fuels, mainly coal, to power yourselves out of the third world into the first, like we did 150 years ago, because we screwed it all up. You know, people go, well, well China, they're, they're not, they're only saying one thing and doing another. Well, look at it from their point of view. Of Never mind, I'm talking about the people of China. Coal is bad. All right, wait a minute. It starts there. Well, yeah, okay, they use 70% of the, like when you want to be self-righteous, you go 70% of the electricity in China is supplied by coal. It's only 11% in Canada. We're global leaders, yeah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Okay, okay, all true. But what does coal replace in China? It replaces small towns where their heat and light is from burning animal dung. Yeah. Same thing in Africa. Exactly. What happens when you burn things like that in your home for, you get pollution levels that kill children. Yeah at an inordinate amount. So first of all, we gotta stop with this idea of good players and bad players. China does it for a reason. Coal is cheap and it's better than what they have. We wanna help them. We're gonna to have to give them ways to supply the power. With it. What could we do? The most significant thing we can do globally is replace coal-fired electricity with the, the tenable fuels we have now, natural gas and nuclear power. Well, there's, there's something, I just, I'm gonna be a little more particular just, just in the Canadian yeah. context. Under the carbon regime that he hopes to bring in, because he's got a lot of competition on it, that's speaking of Trudeau, uh, which has, I would call up BC as the example, uh, certainly hasn't proven to be a real break on anything. I can't, there's no measurement whatsoever so far that I have ever seen that if we have $50 carbon across the country, across all of Canada, it'll take one fraction of our tiny fraction in the contribution to what I still regard as a questionable crisis. That's the first point. Okay. Now, if we are so insignificant, statistically, in reducing these potentially dire emissions, why is this so central a concern? Even if everything they say is true, and we go to this partial measure, China is still there, India is still there. So why is this become a bigger issue than unemployment, or truly poor people, or old people, or veterans? Why this obsession that Canada has any leverage in scientific or practical yeah. terms whatsoever? In those terms, we don't. The argument is that in order to um, ask the rest of the world to do this, you have to show moral leadership by doing it. I gotta interrupt. That may well be the case, but do you, and this is not a partisan point, this is not liberatory. No, <coughs> both their plans are just. Do, do you think that Canada, in any context whatsoever, because we stopped a, a plant in, in Saskatchewan, that China's gonna look around and say, oh, God, Canada just, what no. power do we have as an example? No, no, and, and in the past, um, uh, political leaders have said uh, all of Canada's emissions in a year, a couple coal-fired uh, plants in, in China re replaced that. Yeah. On the practical level, um, it, it's true, we're 1.6% of global emissions. But, but let's look at the, let's look at, for example, and, and this isn't partisan because they're all plants. I know they are. They're all nonsense. Yeah. The Greens, and, and the odd thing is I get along very well with the Greens because what I say to people is if this is your issue, yeah. then the Greens are your party because all of the other programs are farces. I okay. agree with you. But I having said that, uh, what's happened, yeah, $50 a ton. When the Liberals won in 2015, very shortly after that, the Environment Minister was, and this was from one of my sister papers, um, the National Post, yeah. were advised by her, by her own <laughs> experts, absolutely, was advised <laughs> by her own experts that would have to go within the foreseeable future to at least 100 tons and more likely three, sorry, $100 per ton and $300. Um, they know that. They know that they are way short of the commitments that uh, Justin Trudeau made, which used to be Harper's in fairness, yeah, to the Paris Climate Accord in 2015. 
Now, so they know that. What happened recently? The uh, parliamentary budget officer came out with the report. Yep, yep. And he said, if everything else you're doing works, he was being very kind because it isn't working. If everything else you're doing works, you're going to have to raise it from $50 per ton in 2022 to $100 by um, 2030 so that you have a chance of meeting your 2030 target. That comes out just before an election. Catherine McKenna comes up and says, oh, no, no, we're going to freeze it yeah. at 50 in 2022. So a lot of us wrote, well, no, wait a minute. You can't. Your whole, but your, your own document said yes. in 2022, you would relook at it to consider more stringent measures. Now, what does stringent mean? Stringent doesn't mean less. Well, we also had a parliamentary declaration that it's a crisis. That's right. And, and, it's, so, it's, so, and then that happens. She gives an interview with the Globe and Mail where she says, well, um, no, uh, I'm not holding us to that commitment I made two weeks ago. That it was going to be, <laughs> now it's going to be, well, we'll decide. And you, you sit there and you go, if you think this is the existential yeah, problem of our point. age, how could you flip like that in two weeks? It doesn't make any well, sense. Well, I got to stop, stop, stop there because I was going to go somewhere else, but, okay. but that, that really is the core. If they believe what they themselves say, and by, by they I mean the liberal governments, I mean the Greens, I mean the people that seem to be on this cause, the, the young people in the university, mm -hmm. if they believe what they say, why aren't they saying to everybody else, that in this industrialized country, we should shut down, because it's, it's going to kill the planet, that's what they say. We should shut down at least 40% of all of our industrial activity, regardless of the economic or personal cost. What is more important than the continued existence of the physical planet and the people on it? But you ask them, take away an iPhone from a youngster, a young person, or take away a second car from someone in the high middle class, and they'll say, well, you're just out of your... If they, if they believe their own rhetoric, why don't they do say the things that back it up? Yeah, the one, on the issue of like cell phones and that, what I try to say to young people is, because I don't want to discourage idealism, is you got to understand that, that cell phone, that iPhone you use to communicate, and which is a social media, you can't make that without fossil fuels. I don't know, you have the servers you, are you tremendous. Can't, exactly, you can't, build a, uh, you, know, you can't build a car without fossil fuels. There was a... Uh, was an African economist, I think in Kenya, years ago, and they were asking about all this. And he said, the problem is that what you're asking, you're asking me to, to buy into a, a supply of power, which is good for the medical clinic in the town I live in. It can keep the um, medicines cold, and it can supply light. But we need power to build factories. A and so the other problem in Canada, it really a specific problem, was that in signing the original Kyoto Accord all those years ago, which John Cretien did, uh, his, his chief aide, Eddie Goldenberg, said years right. later, uh, we knew we couldn't hit these targets. Of course we did. We wanted 5% more than the Americans. And, and what, yeah, and what they said was that, well, we wanted to, to, to get people ready. Over the years I've looked at it, because I've been studying this for more than a decade, and nothing's changed. Um, if you ask people, are they concerned about climate change, do they want governments to do something, it's generally over two-thirds and over say yes. Right? Then you attach a cost to it, and two thirds say no. Well, I tell you, I'm going to jump in again. If it is as serious as they're saying it is, then governments, liberal or Tory, and the, the, the Tories are cowards, by the way. I'm going to, this is just over their dicta. Oh, uh, the, 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 the Tories say they believe it because they're scared to say that most of them don't believe it, mm -hmm. and they're, they're riding with the current, which is, in my judgment, reaffirming, in some cases, the falsity. But, if they believe what they're saying, if they, Mr. Trudeau had a majority, why wasn't there legislation saying that, I'll give you examples, every second day of the week you can't use your car. We're going to spread this across the whole yep, nation. Yep. Uh, we're, going to, um, we're, we're going to put rations on the amount of air travel. You can go for sickness. You can go to visit relatives maybe once a year or something else. Uh, we're going to slow down the industrial process because, as they have said 150 times, this is the biggest crisis of our time. It's the moral equivalent of World War II. Yep. And yet they come out and they ban single plastic bags. I'm going back to my favorite. And the damn plastic straw. How can they live with themselves? Well, also, they, remember, to me, the, the, there's a whole bunch of reasons this happened. But part of it is it's a new revenue stream. <laughs> now, now, I know, that, I know that, that the prime minister says his carbon tax is revenue neutral. Well, you gave the example of B.C. It started out revenue neutral. Of course it, did. it isn't now. But, but, but this idea of, you know, revenue, like 
Here's what I'd say about the Trudeau carbon tax price, whatever you want to call it. Yes, um, it does make sense to have, if you want people to use less of something, you put a tax on it. But the tax that l the liberals have done is not the tax that people around the world are praising. People around the world go, what you do is you eliminate other taxes that, that are surplus yeah. yeah. to the issue of carbon, and you load up on carbon taxes. You don't add a carbon yeah, tax right. onto everything, everything else. else. And so, so this, this myth, and that's why, it, frankly, it doesn't work. Now, to be fair, the conservatives say they can hit the Paris climate targets <laughs> without a carbon tax. That's absurd. It is absurd. If, if you're going to do this, it's exactly what... I've said this before. In all the years, I've, I've, as a layperson and an English major, I've studied this issue. Two people, to me, have always made sense. One is, was Stephen Harper, and one was Elizabeth May. Why Stephen Harper? Because Harper said, as yeah, you mentioned I, earlier, uh, um, you know what? We can't do this in a, in, in a, in a small northern fossil fuel based spread out country, cold, we can't do this. So what did he do? He said, what he did was he matched himself to the Americans. When Obama said, and it looked like he was going to get through the Congress, a cap and trade, yep. that's when Harper said, we're going to participate in cap and trade. People today accuse him of being hypocritical. He wasn't hypocritical. He, he saw the Americans and he said, the Americans do it, we have to do it, obviously, for a whole bunch of reasons, right? When that thing collapsed, then he backed off. He said, no, we're going to do it. And he said, well, you used to do it. Yeah, I, I did it when the Americans exactly. looked like they were doing it. Elizabeth May, on the other hand, understands the enormity of the problem. And I've seen people, like, you know, ridicule her plan and all, all that. I think but, I'm but, one of them. But, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. She's the one who most often says, and she's right, this would be like World War II without the bombs, right? This would be a fundamental reorganization of Canadian society. Now, the other problem to add on to all of this is that the Paris climate targets were given in 2015. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the United Nations um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have since updated that. Basically, all countries in the world would have to double what they're doing yeah, exactly. in, that they agreed to in yes, 2015. Exactly. So, so the, the limits, like what I always try to show that people observe, they go, okay, to meet 2030, you know what we'd have to do? We'd have to eliminate the equivalent of, of carbon emissions in 10 years from our entire oil and gas sector, right? Mm -hmm. If you put on the new ones, now you're doing most of the oil and gas sector and most of the transportation sector. Um, uh, this is all a fantasy. It is a fantasy. I, I want to get back to that. <clears throat> There's a couple of things there. But you, you introduced the oil and gas sector. If it was any, I, I'm, I, I believe this actually, if it was any other industry, uh, I don't think you could. They, they've made a, especially the, the world organizations, formal and informal of environmental, I call it hysterical activism, uh, much like they did with the Newfoundland seal hunt, uh, have made symbolic uh, the, the oil operations in one province uh, in Canada in, in, of all the nations of the world. And it's not China, and it's not Indonesia, and it's not Argentina or Venezuela. Uh, it's Fort McMurray and Calgary. And if we don't stop that thing there, and if we don't stop the, the one possible addition to a pipeline, then the world has come to doom. Our friend Neil Young refers to Fort McMurray as Hiroshima, which seems to me to be inexplicably bad taste. This is another thing. How is it that the government can be so concerned with, in my view, a fantastical projection of imminent disaster globally uh, to hit, over which it has but minuscule leverage, and be so casual about the decimation of one of the central industries of this country? Well, because it's not about economics, it's about politics. On the specific complaint about the oil sands, uh, not too long ago, um, Andrew Weaver, who is now yeah, the Greens in the NDP and one of the world's leading climate scientists, he, he was one of the, he's one of the very credible uh, climate scientists on the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change. He did, you know, they do computer projections in that. And he came out with a study that said, and he was surprised by it, he said, it's not the oil sands that's the problem. It's not all of the oil that's the problem. It's coal. Coal is the one that if the science is correct, is driving up these numbers. Now, I want to be fair to him, because we've always, I mean, we've talked once or twice, and it's always been civil. He still believes that we should you know, clean I up know. our own house. I know. But, but he said, he wrote about it, he said, I was surprised. It, it, was, it was cool. So the basic argument has nothing to do with reality. Now, why do politicians do what they do? 
why did Barack Obama originally start out saying about the, um, Keystone. the, 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 Keystone. Yeah, the Keystone XL? Yeah, well, we're going to look at it, we're going to have. And then yeah. there was a couple studies, and they went, well, you know, actually, if you don't do it this way, you're going to have to do it by, by rail, and, and it's actually going to be worse, blah, 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 blah. But then ultimately, he denied it. Ultimately means eight years yeah. of listening to these yeah. are eight years. Right, right. And then what happened was he, he, he doesn't want to lose the environmentalists, right? So that's the one he stops. I need credentials to go to Paris, is what he said. While he does that, he, he, he bragged to, to, to pipeline fitters in mid-America that under his administration, the U.S. had laid more pipeline for oil and natural than to, more than to encircle the earth. So what did he do? He made the oil sands a boogeyman, became a hero by going after Keystone, by an American environmental movement, which focused primarily on Keystone. Yes. Why? Because it's easy to make life miserable for your neighbors to the north as opposed to cost jobs. Exactly. So, so what I never understood was, like when Trudeau and um, Obama had that bromance. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, I said, okay, you don't have to, you don't have to hit the guy. But say but something. But you've got to speak up for Canada here. Um, you Not know, on this subject. You've got to say your own studies showed it'll be worse. The State Department mm -hmm. approved it. Yeah, well, after, after twice yeah. saying it might. Yeah. So, so it, it's, it's, just, it's just all politics. It, it, it's, it's people. A, we have politicians like that. And then the other one I always talk about is, look, if you live in Toronto, in a, in a place like uh, Rosedale or the Annex or Forest Hill, this is when Harper was in power, and you go to Europe twice a year for vacations, and you buy food from exotic places, oh, yeah. and you have two SUVs in the driveway, it is absurd for you to tell me that Stephen Harper is destroying the planet. It's also absurd to say that places like China and Africa that you have already referenced, yeah. that these people at, at a minuscule level of existence have got to even shorten their, their lifespans again. Yeah, it, 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 it is, it, it's just strange. Well, that, that brings up the other point. That this is a speculation of a psychological nature. Uh, I wonder, I really do, we're a natural resources country. Anyone from Newfoundland, BC, North, doesn't matter where we all started with furs or fish or some damn thing, woods. Uh, we carved it out so as much as it was, uh, and we built over in a remarkably short period of time, partly due to the fact we're next to the U.S., but a splendid spot. There's no one who wants to really desert the, I'll call it the, in terms of worldings, the comparative luxuries, both of peace of, and, and temperament and goods that this place is. In fact, I think compared to say my father or your father or certainly grandfathers oh. of everybody, if you were to go back to the 20s and 1910s in various provinces, you'd say, well, you know, we, we have to work 16 hours a day just to get the next meal. Is it that we have become relative to others in this world, so protected, so secure, we can always think of the future without anxiety. I'm gonna send my such and such to college. You're talking eight, nine, 10 years. People in the world that can't predict two days from now. Does luxury and wealth and the security that comes from being next to a powerful military country that's peaceful lead us to this indulgence that now that we've reached the plateau, let's spit on all the ways that brought us here. Well, I think, I think there's two issues there. I don't think, um, as, as we talked about, the lower-income people, uh, poor people in, in the first world um, think that way, because they have to worry, too. Yes. The greatest environmentalists in Canada are poor people. They live in multiple residences. You, you, you make a very good they point. Eat, they eat food locally. They take public transit. We don't they need don't to, waste. We don't need to do anything to poor... In fact, we probably should help them with some of these revenues that they're yeah. going to spend on whatever they're going to spend on. But, but people who, um, the classic example of what you're talking about to me is Earth Hour. Ah. Earth, Earth Hour comes once a year, and for an hour, um, <laughs> it, it, when the climate is mild, every, yeah. everybody turns off their, or they used to, I mean, fewer and fewer do. And then you have people who, um, they go outside and they start a, um, I, they burn candles inside, and then they go outside and they have a bonfire. <laughs> well, no, no, wait, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's actually worse for a whole bunch of reasons. Yeah. But what I, what I always say to people when they raise that up is, okay, you've done it for one hour. 
And yeah, everybody can do it. It's easy. It, it, it's nice. It's in the spring or whenever the it's hell it is. It's a party. It's a party. Now do that for a year. And I said, if we did that for a year, uh, most of us would be dead. Uh, our ancestors would have been dead because they would have known how to survive. Our cities would be in chaos in a week. That's right. So, so um, like, it's sort of like another one I loved because a very inefficient way to lower emissions is electric vehicles. So they go, well, no, it's great if we have the electricity, then we put on the yeah, thing, yeah. and there's no, and you sort of them, well, wait a minute, that all depends, that's fine when you have 1,000, 2,000, but when everybody's got an electric vehicle, now you have to look at the power source, and if your power source is coal, it could actually be worse than gas-powered, because frankly, gas-powered has made such huge advances, in part because of government regulation. Now when they say, this will save 10 million cars, well, that, the only reason for that is the cars are so frigging efficient. Yeah. You know, you, you, like, in other words, you're bolstering the number beyond what it should be. Because, so, and, and the other point is, like, there, Ontario is a classic example. Yeah. There are perfectly sensible things we can do. Ontario, uh, from 2003 to 2014, eliminated coal, which was 25% of the electricity uh, supply. Um, good. I mean, you know, what did they do? They used natural gas and they used nuclear power. Yeah. Nuclear power has a different problem, which is, nu which is radioactivity, but no, no greenhouse no gas emissions. No emissions at all. Natural gas, as I've said, half the carbon. So they did it. That was great. But then what did they do? They spent billions of dollars on wind and solar, yeah. which was totally unneeded. And it wasn't better. Why wasn't it better? Cost. Because, because well, not just that, but because for wind and solar, you to have to have uh, natural backup. gas to back them up. So all you had to do was eliminate that. And the, the Auditor General talked about $9.2 billion yeah, more than they had to. Simply, and, and she wasn't saying don't have the wind and solar. She said, if you just listen to your experts about the level of subsidy you had to make, okay. it would have been fine. But you went over that. This comes back to the, what is the thread for me in all of this. And I, I know you, you are dealing with argument and you do do, that's one of the reasons I want to talk to you. You're, you're more sane than I am, that's a fact. But I'm serious. Uh, I've been called worse. <laughs> well, you will be <laughs> later. <laughs> but no, I think this, I'm going to get your reaction to it. I think that this issue is far from the, the so-called science. Science is a talismanic term they throw in to color the argument. It, as you said at the beginning, it has these cultural overtones, but it's something else again. The, the attachment of some people to this story, I don't like the term narrative, the attachment of some people to this story is so fierce and it, it operates in abandonment of all facts. It ignores utterly projections that we've seen since at least 2000 about the time we have left, the melting of the Himalayas, the this, the that, the projections backwards, the scandal of climate gate, all these things. They can, they, can have, they can have a rutted road of failed projections, of failed predictions. None of that enters into consciousness. And yet, this is where I'm coming to you, and yet if someone like you, uh, who is a decent human being, says there are some counter notions, just some, and you're not rabbit and you're not fanatical, there are some counter notions, and I think I should introduce them. I would suggest to you that perhaps on a parallel with writing about Israel, Writing about climate change is the most dangerous thing for a column, not dangerous, but yeah, you know, maybe dangerous, that a columnist can do in a first world country. I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's dangerous. And I have a lot of people who agree with me, but let me be clear in my position. Okay. From the very beginning, um, I have said, I believe in man-made climate change. I believe there's a problem here. I don't think it's the imminent existential threat we're talking about. And I think there are logical things we can do as long as everybody's not running around with like chickens with their heads cut off. And that has to do with using nuclear power and natural gas to bridge us to the fuels of the future. One of which, two of which will be wind and solar when we can get a battery that stores electricity at industrial levels. And why are those things good in and of itself? You're getting rid of coal. That's good. There's less, there's less pollution. Okay. But, but on the point you made, every generation has had cultists who believe um, the end of the world is coming. It's a form of pride, really. Our age is so special yeah. that we, the problem now is that they're in charge. They're, they're in charge and, and they, either they believe it or, or there are enough people who believe it that politicians go, well, we have to, we have to do something, right? And so it, it, it just becomes 
Um, Go ahead. I just, I just think that there are two professions, maybe there are others, but there are two professions that depend, I'm going to be extravagant even though I think it's true, that not only depend, their cardinal virtue is skepticism. One is science, and that's way above the other one, which is ours, uh, what we are pleased to call journalism. I cannot recall, and <clears throat> you correct me, I cannot recall a story that has such vast ramifications. It is the globe, it is the economy, it is bringing people out of poverty or keeping them in it, it is also the, the apocalypse itself, just their own words. And yet, I cannot recall a story of that scope and range and depth that per either permits or has shown within the major sources of news or many of the middle level news, to any tolerance of maybe there's another argument, shall we bring in this particular journalist who's done a specialty study on it who doesn't quite agree with the full range of hypocrisy? Shall we talk with a Ross McKittrick or shall we go to a Roger Pilke? How many interviews on any of the major channels, just to pick one, one area, of this country's, they're propagating the news, they're not reporting it. Why are, why are journalists so, I don't know, uh, so isolated from their own virtue of skepticism? Yeah, I, I would say that often depends on the, the media culture at, at the, uh, but, but, but what I would say has happened is that there has been a conscious effort to say there is only one side of this story. Oh, that, the concern it. I have is that many journalists have bought into that, that you don't talk to anybody to the point where the Canadian Environment Minister, Catherine uh, McKenna, was being interviewed by Evan Solomon about these issues. And at one point she basically said she doesn't want to talk to people who and don't, who don't, and, and, and Evan Solomon went correctly, wait a minute, you're the minister, you have to talk to people. But, that's, but even that, agree. Gloria, even that's really isolated. Yeah, oh, no, if, if you stand back and look at news, so-called news coverage on this issue, you will, if it's a heavy rain day in Toronto, suddenly it's climate change. Anything that pops, even the, the pop culture programs, yep. even the, the, the dreaded empty minds of Hollywood, <clears throat> anytime you got some, it's everywhere. I have never seen an issue that has such little serious scrutiny applied to it saturate the minds of so many. And journalists, who are supposed to be the cautionaries, they will, don't go too far, make sure you know the facts, mm -hmm. they're on this wagon. In fact, I think partly they're the fuel of it. Yeah, when I started writing about this years ago, um, it was uncomfortable because I, got, I was being called a stooge of the oil industry. <laughs> I'm familiar and, with that. And, yeah, and, and, and I was... Um, <laughs> And I was being called a climate denier, which particularly angered me. Well, it should you. Because the, the deliberate link there was to the Holocaust. And, and people, people who were saying it specifically said oh, they were using they, it for that, that reason. And, and now, today, I've got them all confused. Because like, I've gone into some audiences where I'm supposed to be the, the, the right-wing lunatic. Demon, yeah. And then I go, look, if you want to do this, you've got to raise the carbon price six times what it is now. You've got to get up to 300. Get and here's what you have to do. Rhetoric. And you have to vote green, blah, blah, blah. And they look at me and they go, what? And I go, well, I'm just telling you that if, if you believe what you are saying, then I agree, here are the things you should do. Um, and I usually come out of them unscathed. Um, but but even when, even climate skepticism has now turned into a dirty word. You oh, yeah, it is. Skepticism is the basis of science. It is. You, and journalism. Because, because it, it, what it protects you from is assuming something it protects you from confirmation bias, which is you, you see the evidence and you naturally fit it into your worldview, rather than you look at the evidence and figure out what your worldview you, should be. You, you have hit a, an extremely central point. I'm leaving the politics of it alone. Uh, we have serious and extremely intelligent minds in industry and the universities, etc. And anyone who's looked at, at science from the Royal Society in 1660 to the present minute, and the advance, and don't avoid the word, the advance of human civilization because of subjection, subjection to evidence, subjection to questions and rhetoric. You, you hit it right there. Why is it on, on this particular subject that there has been so much government subsidy and so much government propulsion of research into one direction that science has lost the one thing that always keeps it sane? We try to disprove more than ever we try to prove we try to set up set particular cases. Can we make <clears throat> some de demonstration this is wrong? Why are we not getting equivalent research into the whole range of the topic rather than 
feeding into the government-sponsored, environmentally activated presumption that we already know this. We do not. Well, look, if you're, if you're a scientist today and you're looking for government grants, are you going to do uh, studies that would you think will prove the theory of anthropogenic climate change or disprove? Uh, obviously, we know where, where that's going to go. Um, and so, and the other problem I've, I've found is that there are a lot of good, very credible scientists, and I've read their work, uh, and they're, I think Mr. Weaver is very credible. I think there, there are others that are, are very credible. But what I have concerns about, and, and Weaver, good for him, went into politics. He voted, and now he has okay. an agenda. Okay. But when I was reading about some of the world's most prominent climate scientists, they go from their science to what we should do. Oh, of course. And it's like, wait a minute. That's not your territory. You're supposed to tell me the challenges. It's not your job to tell, as if you were a politician, what we're going to do. Well, again, you hit an extremely important point. The deliberate, I'm, I'm a bit harder than you, the deliberate confusion of the facts as they are and then the moral imperative to act in a certain way. If you do have a, a, an indifferent, in a positive sense, a disinterested intelligence, and you look at the thing and you say, it's either this or it's that, your expertise is in that domain. But the environmental movement, which I think is almost rabid, at, certainly at its extreme levels, they, they translate, they do a, a subtle shifting of the P here, they translate, this is the science, from if you disagree with my policy prescriptions, you are, the hateful word, a denier. And I mean, here's, here's, the first, here's what I would say to any politician who wants to tackle this issue seriously. Um, you need to stop listening to uh, too many folks who have political science degrees in the environmental movement. <laughs> you need to talk to engineers. You need to talk to chemical engineers. You need to talk to people who build things because they will tell you what's realistic. And the other half of it is how have we solved every environmental we've ever faced? We've done it through technology. Um, not just on the climate, take the example of food in the world. Exactly. In the 1970s, we all remember the population bomb. We also remember the, cl the Club of Rome, which yeah. was another futurology yeah. project. Yeah. And, you know, I believe you know, Paul Ehrlich, and we, and we were all going to be dead by now yeah, because exactly. of global famine. Science was settled. And why? Because of the theory that population grows exponentially. And, and the, what Ehrlich totally missed was the green revolution in agriculture. GMOs. Where it became much more, uh, we were able to produce more. Yeah. And it goes to the idea of people who, even all of these doomsday things, remember what they always say. They say, if nothing changes 100 years from now. Okay, there, there's a story that a lot of us use about, a century ago, there was a global conference in, in, I believe it was in New York, of scientists and experts who were terrified and were telling the world, if current trends keep up a century from now, New York's going to be neck deep in horse manure. If you go back and look at pictures like... Are you sure it isn't? I, I, if you go back and look at pictures of Toronto in the winter and you see the snow and then you see all this... That's not dirt. That's horse manure. I know. And it was piled up in huge... What was the savior of cities? Public transit and the car. The car was the original savior of cities. Technology, acid rain. What did we do? Technologists came up with ways to replace the things we need. So we need to respect... In Ontario, whenever they would do a 10-year plan for um, electricity, right? Yeah. And then you would go to the, to the actual engineers. And off the record, they would say to you, this doesn't go. This isn't going to work, and here's why. And then ten or seven to 10 years later, it wouldn't work. And you'd go back, and they'd go, yeah, we knew that. Nobody wanted to listen to us. Um, uh, again, to, to me, the problem is that this, this issue has so divided us, where there is, there's so many logical things we could be doing. Well, again, I, we got to keep not returning, but it, it's the same thing. If you speak of it as an issue, if you speak of it as what we call a straightforward, factually based, whatever they call it, issue, you have no problem. But this is the cardinal issue, or others too, that has taken on a secondary, call it a carapace, or call it a, a change of essence. This is a test of your virtue. Yeah. And, and it really is. And if you, know, if you wear the green armband or as you say, shut off the, the fan for one hour during a certain day of the year and mouth the platitudes, uh, then you're a good person. That's why all these, these, these brain dead uh, celebrities going around to these parties, they're just, well, their movies cost $100 million to keep you in the dark for two hours. Yeah, they're, they're a handful. It's virtue. They're a handful who are sincere. The one I always get is how can you say this uh, 
if you have children and grandchildren. <laughs> and to which I always respond, yes, I do, and I care about them. And when I'm gone, I want there to be enough power for them to live their lives, because if there isn't enough power... I, I mean, an example I use is, just think of the huge power failure we had years ago over half of North America. If that had gone on longer than it did, what would have happened? The social order would have broken down. Um, remember, if you don't have electricity, for example, it's not just, you, first of all, you, you have to stop work when the sun goes down. Second of all, you can't store food. You can't store medication. You can't make a hospital room sterilized. People don't understand how endemic fossil uh, electricity is to our way of lives and how endemic fossil fuels are to electricity. And they do not also, here's another thing they don't understand, and you, you brought up the, the Toronto-centric stuff earlier on. Toronto is a great metropolis. It's a great city. I love it. Yeah, life. I like Toronto. Uh, does anybody in this city realize that, I won't, I won't go to your, your months or anything, I think if you had one week in the city without, uh, without electricity, without power, mm -hmm. Uh, you would have uh, you would have a murderous situation. Do people understand the fragility of the securities we have? Just how fragile the underlay is, and this leads to this question: Does this obsession with, in a sense, wounding the infrastructure of our own prosperity, which is how I view this thing, do they understand how ultimately how perilous and perilous that is? In Toronto, no. I, I mean, look, it, 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 we, it's already happening to the. Um to the oil sector, um, but they're far away. What I always say to people is, well, what if people in Western Canada were saying you have to shut down the auto sector? But I often in, that. That's in, a good in, question in still. How would, you, how would you feel? Well, why, let me jump on that. Why don't they say? I mean, this is the same rhetoric. I've, I've thought about it a lot. If, because if it, most of them are in Ottawa, Montreal, Well, that, that's not good enough. <laughs> if the world is ending and we should shut down, the, that's good. Yeah. Okay, well, the, well, the main drivers are cars and planes, so shut down Bombardier and shut down the auto sector. Well, I always remembered when, um, when Dalton McGuinney was in power in Ontario and they were doing all the stuff about, and then they would announce and subsidy to the, to the auto sector. We saved the auto sector when it was going under in the 2008 global recession. Um, there's all, look, there's all kinds of things. A hurricane hits somewhere, and politicians um, come and say, we're going to rebuild it, exactly like, yeah, New, like, like New Orleans. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. New Orleans right now is, is between an ocean, an ocean with a lot of warm water, the Gulf, and, and a, a lake that's higher than the... <laughs> and, and what survived? The old quarter. Why? Because they built it on a hill. So in other words, I'm listening to all this, we're going to, well, no, you shouldn't rebuild the way you did. Now you've got a chance to build it so it's safer, uh, that's, regardless of global warming. Well, then you've you got the other contradiction that goes on here. It is maintained that the world, it's, again, the phrase, existential threat, the planet will be over, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't mimic almost to exactitude the very particular, you don't use nuclear, don't use natural gas, shut down the oil, if you don't mimic their particular policy prescriptions. And then it doesn't matter. As you said, and I know about the radioactive material, but if you were really, really, if the world's going to end, we let's, get the, let's get the damn reactors, because otherwise it doesn't matter. We can, no. And in fairness, there are a number of, of, of even climate journalists, one of the best in the world, one of the most knowledgeable is George, George Monbiot. A lot of them have come over to the view that nuclear has to be part of the solution. But if you look at the numbers and the need, it has to be. But that's the other problem. Radicals, you're telling us this is the this is the most serious threat of our age. Of any age. And then, if that's the case, yeah. then stop with the hippie stuff from the 1960s about the dangers of nuclear war, and start getting realistic that that using nuclear power responsibly is a way to deal with this. And yes, there have been there have been accidents, there have been. But if you want to talk about deaths in okay. the energy industry. Talk about dams that blew up. Talk about coal mining. Um, and so it's it just, see, these are things to me that tell me that people who say these things are not sincere. It tells me that they're not serious. It also, well, we haven't got time to get into this, but it also tells me, and this is something we haven't touched, but it's massive, that underneath the seriousness, and there are some of them that are serious, even I believe that, yeah. but underneath the seriousness of this thing, there's also a radical politics that has other imperatives other than anything about the environment, and the environment is a good bulldozer, to mix my metaphors, to push another agenda. Well, I got two more for you because I know this is, is, is a busy day. This is more personal than anything else, not personal, personal, but just personal, but your journalism. 
What separated you? I'm not trying to flatter you, but because it, it is true. I, I watch this a lot. What separated you from, from the mass of what I'll call conventional journalists in that even though you're, you know, you, you're accepting a lot of the theses, that you say, well, there's still a lot of questions, and I, I read your columns more faithfully than you know, and the questions have to be aired and said in public. I don't know anyone of your stature uh, that, that does this. Where did you get either the spine or the interest I was to go on, at this? I was on medical leave years ago. I had some uh, health problems, and um, but my paper, which, which were very generous in the way they handled it, you know, they wanted me to like, like, you know, just do what you can. So I started, um, I was actually, it was clinical depression. I don't mind telling okay. you. I said that before. And so I sort of went, well, when I get back, I've got to figure out something about climate change. Everybody's talking about it, right? So I started reading. I started with a book called The Rough Guide to Climate Change, which was a very middle of the road. Yeah. Here are the issues. Uh, no, no one would accuse it that book of being a, a, but it explained things very clearly. And, and it referred me to other books. So then I started reading books about in, environmentalists talking about the enormity of the problem. And then I started reading people talking about, um, uh, you know, their, like who supported the oil industry in ways they um. could. But, but, what, but where I learned about the enormity of what had to be done was from real environmentalists. They were the ones who taught me through their books that this is what we have to do. For example, in the Rough Guide to Climate Change, one of the things that was being pushed by government at that time in, in, in Canada was ethanol subsidies, yeah. right? <laughs> and they were using corn. I don't know. And, and this fellow said, well, first of all, you don't want to use corn because it's so nutritious for it's humans. It's food. <laughs> but if you, want to, if you want to manufacture enough of this stuff to make a dent, You'll have to take up India with corn. If you take up India with corn globally, people who rely on corn are going to starve to death. And so it, it, the irony I always say is that really I get along fine with a lot of people who see this as more serious concern than I do because they taught me the enormity of what needs to be done. Okay. And so while I don't agree with it, what I always say is to other people, if you believe I know. this is it, you have to then you have to do a whole you bunch gotta of things. You got to take your medicine. That's right. And so, like every time I write, I say, "Vote the Greens." All the Greens are, you know, Lori Goldstein says, "Vote for the Greens." <laughs> and I go, well, well, "Well, wait a minute. I, what I'm saying is that." It, but I, I just qualify. No, I said, if you believe this is the issue, then you cannot listen to Justin Trudeau. You cannot listen to Andrew Scheer. They are not telling you the truth about what's going. And it's both of them. Let's be fair. Is, they're both no, participating in the I, same I think, fantasy. I think Shear is, is being cowardly on this they're, issue. They're both participating in the same fantasy. But, but uh, I don't agree with everything. That, but no, that, that's, that's what you've got to do, folks. This is what okay. we have to do. So do it. If, do it or don't do it. But don't run around, mah, mah, mah. Anybody who disagrees with you hates the planet because that's not the issue. The uh, very last one, this is a journalism question more general. I view, because again, I've, I've been out of the field a lot too, uh, not as scrupulous as you, but when I look at the major news on, on climate from either a so-called authoritative outlets, middle-range outfits, et cetera, I don't see it as news at all. Uh, I see it as people who think it's within their private domain in some cases, that they think this is the right thing, so I, I'm going to make sure that the cause gets backed by the way I report. And news on climate change from so many big sources is closer to propaganda than it is to information. I would say, um, what I would say is that there is that, when I started, I really started reading uh, European, um, uh, because th they're, they're 10 to 20 years ahead of us on them. The Guardian is one of the most green newspapers in the world, but it is very valuable to read, because they understand what they're talking about. And whether you agree or disagree with it, they actually, they actually um, very often, like, they'll say, um, there was a study, look, by an environmental group, I read everything uh, uh, recently, going into the G7, they went, Canada's plan is so bad, it's almost as bad as the United States, which doesn't have one. That's right. And, and so, it's, and the way I started all this years ago, I remember it like it was this day. I get a call from a, a, um, a lady who said, one of our readers, and said, in Toronto, and said, I've heard that in the UK, They've had to get rid of nurses and um, it was nurses and teachers, professors, 
to pay to buy carbon credits ah. to and I and I ah. said to her I said to her I haven't heard that um, I'll, you know, I'll, sure I'll take a look and I remember the first thing I started calling up articles from the UK papers oh my god it's true it's true it's so sad and and that really started me on um, uh, I had all this other background yeah but then I read that and I went Something is oh wrong here. Oh my God! Something is wrong here. Why? Why wouldn't you at least? Because why? A university has a big old boiler system, right? Hospitals have big old boiler systems. A lot of hospitals are affiliated with each other. They have old boilers. So the government says, no, you got to pay this, you know, much per And so what do they do? They look at their budgets and go, we got to let go of fifty nurses. I know. And then the the illogical things just started to escalate on steroids. It, it was like, and so it, to me, it was always come back to. You know, the philosophical question is, what is the good life? To me, the government question is, how can we do good? And, we, and they don't, they're not doing good with this. They're well, doing bad. Uh, just because it is time, time sensitive, I'll bring you back to where you started. I think the most absurd one so far, and this is only from the time we're talking here now, it's only three or four weeks ago, when you had that uh, Google conference with the 500,000 foot yachts and, and, and 111 private jets going in to talk about rationing power for the world. Uh, it, you've, you've just ended it. The illustration you give to me about the teachers uh, uh, and, and, and the other people getting laid off in hospitals, there's a great undercurrent and it's very, 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 very grounded of irrationality that is also part of this thing. And it, it, has, it has metaphysical or religious connotations for some minds. And once people are persuaded in that sense, then the idea of argument uh, becomes irrelevant. Anyway, Laurie, I know it's a very, very busy day. You're an extremely kind human being. <laughs> and I wish I had your scruples. <laughs> nice. Well, you not really, but thank you. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Nice to meet you. Thanks, lads.